chapter 3 as we continue our study of getting to know God. Exodus. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to be here for a long morning this morning, guys. I apologize. I've got a lot running through my head. So uh, let's just pray that God's Spirit be on me and uh, use my lips. i got to get out of the way this morning. Exodus chapter 3. I know when I heard some snickers over here, I'm wrong about something. As long as they don't come from this side, we're all right. <laughs> this side, we're good. This side, it's standing, so we have to watch out. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 10 through 15. Getting to know God. A study of the Old Testament names of God. And today we're going to look at the name Yahweh or Jehovah. Yahweh or Jehovah. All right? Uh, our theme verse is Psalm 148, 13. And uh, the word Lord in this text, 148.13 of Psalms, is the Hebrew name Yahweh or Jehovah, which is the name we're going to look at today. Now, for the last several weeks, I've read Psalm 148.13. This week, I thought, since I've messed everything up, I'm going to let you guys uh, read it with me this morning. So let's read Psalm 148.13 together. It says... Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. So in this series, our goal is to praise the name of the Lord as we get to know Him. Not just throughout the series only, but every day we have the breath of God, we need to praise His name. That's why we're here. We're here to bring Him glory however He desires for us in our life. Now, I believe that the more we get to know God, which I hope that as you come to church and you participate in worship and you study the Bible and you pray, so as you do those things, I hope that you get to know God uh, more deeply or more intimately. All right? So uh, the more we get to know God, who He is, and more importantly, who He is to us and how He is toward us, the more you would want to praise Him. So that's what we're going after here. That's what Psalm 148, 13 is saying. Get to know God. The more you get to know Him, the more you'll want to praise Him. Now this morning, we want to get to know God by looking at His most used name in the Old Testament. And that's the name Yahweh or Jehovah. This name uh, occurs 6,500 times in over 5,500 verses throughout the Old Testament. So, uh, just in case you were unaware, the Bible is about God, right? It's about Jesus as we see with this, right? 6,500 times the name Yahweh is mentioned in the Old Testament. So this is a hymn book. It's all about Him. We see that clear from this name. Again, this is the most used name of God. But to me, it's also one of the most intriguing, one of the most interesting names of God. And one of the main reasons that it's so interesting and intriguing is because God um, basically gives this name to Himself. He says, this is who I am. Right? And so... That's why I think this name is so intriguing and so important. So let's dive in. Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 10, going through verse 15. And it says, Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses says to God, or said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of 
Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. Let us pray. Father, we just come humbly before you. Lord, realizing that we can't do nothing apart from you. God certainly can't stand behind this pulpit and behind this word and even begin to speak truth without you helping me. So God, I ask you um, uh, to help me to speak what it is that you would have me to speak. Lord, may you use uh, my list for your service. And God, I pray for every one that's in this room. God, every heart that's here. And God, if there's a heart that's strayed away, if there's a, God, a heart that's never came to you, God, if there's a heart that's struggling and wondering and asking questions, God, I pray that today you'll just be so real to them, Lord, that they'll know that it's you and it'll draw them into a deeper, more intimate, or even a personal relationship with you. And so, God, we pray, Lord, that you'll just move in a mighty way amongst us today. God, may we realize who you are, and Lord, more importantly, where you are. And Lord, that is with us. And so God, we thank you, we praise you, Lord, for all your blessings, for all that you're doing. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Now, I'm assuming we're going live again today, so I want to welcome those who are joining us via Facebook Live. Uh, let us know that you're with us. Drop a prayer request in and we can pray with you. But uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. I'm sure you know the story of Moses. I'm sure you probably watched The Prince of Egypt or something along those lines. And so you know, or The Ten Commandments, you probably know the story of Moses. But I want to share his story very briefly to give a background of what we're talking about here. So Moses, at three months old, um, was put into a basket. He was put into what the Bible calls an ark. And the reason it's called an ark because they filled it with pitch on the inside and outside because they wanted it to float and they didn't want it to leak. All right? Because what they did, uh, Moses' mom and Moses' sister put Moses inside this ark, inside this basket, and they placed it in the river and they sent it down the river where it was later discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. Now, the reason they did that is because they were taking the, the firstborn sons or the sons and, and they were killing them um, because the Egyptians or the Hebrews were growing in such a massive rate. They were just having babies like crazy and there were going to be an army if they didn't be careful. So the Egyptians thought that they'd destroy them. So they wanted to save Moses. God had a plan for Moses. They put him in this basket, sent him down the river. Pharaoh's daughter family asked the Pharaoh if she could keep him. And so she keeps Moses um, as her own son. But uh, she couldn't nurse him. So she um, finds somebody with the help of Moses' sister and the higher Moses' mom to nurse him. And so there Moses is with his mom there in Pharaoh's palace. And so Moses grew up uh, in Pharaoh's palace in Egypt for 40 years. So he's 40 years old, um, knows all about the Egyptian life, knows all about the Egyptian culture, knows all about the Pharaoh. But there was something inside of Moses that he knew was different. He knew that something was different about him. Um, he obviously knew that he wasn't uh, Egyptian, but that he was a Jew, and so he was burdened for his people. And so he went out amongst his people, and while he was out, he saw one of the Hebrew children, or one of the Hebrew men, uh, being mistreated by an Egyptian. And this infuriated Moses, and Moses killed the Egyptian. Now, the Hebrews didn't even so much to thank Moses for what he did, right? He just killed this Egyptian who was abusing you, and they didn't even say thank you, but rather they ridiculed him. They're like, oh, you're going to judge us now? Oh, you're going to kill us now? I mean, so they really gave him a hard time, but Moses was confused, and he was afraid, and so he ran, right? He ran to a place called Midian. And so while he was there, he saw some women at the well. It seems to me that that is where these Old Testament men always meet women is at the well, right? That's where Isaac found his wife, or actually uh, Abraham's servant found Isaac's wife there at the well. But evidently, that's where they went to pick up ladies. But he's at a well, and there's some ladies there at the well, and they're trying to feed the flock, the water, the flock, and there's some shepherds, right? Some some mean, uh, rugged shepherds come up and begin to tease the ladies, begin to give these ladies a hard time, and Moses. He goes and he handles business like a gentleman would do, right? He goes up and I don't know exactly what he does. The Bible doesn't really say. It doesn't really matter. We just know that he rescued these women. These women were going crazy. Moses heard greatest, but they left him at the well. They left Moses standing at the well. They went home, told their dad, and their dad's like, well, where is this man, right? And he says, well, he's at the well. They said, well, go get him. We need to feed him. 
And so they bring, uh, they bring Moses back home, and, and he's like, thank you so much for rescuing my daughters, all this kind of stuff. And so not only did he give him a meal, but he gave him a wife, right? And so he fed him dinner and gave him wife, and so Moses gets married, and her name is Zipporah. And so he, what a day for Moses, right? I don't know if it all happened in one day or not, but what, what a time for him. So Moses is living a good life, all right? Moses, he, he or at least it is in his mindset. He's got a job now, working for his father-in-law, Jethro, right? Tending the flock. So he's got a job. He's got a wife now. He's got a couple of sons by this point. And and all seemed good to Moses, right? Everything's going good until he was out tending the flock one day. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, there was a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed, all right? That really don't register to us a whole lot because, um, I mean, we, we've heard it since we were kids, and so it's kind of like, it's almost natural for us to think of this bush that wasn't being consumed. But let's think about Abraham, or Moses here. Let's put it in our minds uh, to where he is. I bet Moses was blown away by this. We're talking about a bush that is not consumed by this fire. It's not unusual, I don't guess, that there was even a fire in a bush out in wherever he was in Midian, right? I don't guess that was any kind of crazy, but now here it is not even being consumed. I can only imagine what Moses was thinking here. I, I can only imagine. I bet he was thinking something like this. I'll never have to cut firewood again, right? Here's a bush that is not consumed. All I've got to do is transplant it from here to home, and I'll never have to cut firewood again. And Moses is probably pretty excited about that because he's probably getting about 80 years old at this point. And I don't know about you. But I don't even want to cut firewood at 40, much less at 80. So this probably excited him uh, pretty good. So he decides he'd get a little closer to get a closer look at this bush that was burning but wasn't being consumed. And then as he was getting closer, a voice spoke out of this bush. And of course, the, bu the, uh, the bush told him to take his shoes off because he was on holy ground. All right? And so he took his shoes off, and this bush introduces himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And whenever Moses realized that it was God speaking to him, Moses hid his face. Now that's a sermon for another day, because here's the thing. When we enter into the presence of God, uh, we are exposed. Right? We are exposed. My job as a pastor a lot of times is to introduce you to Jesus, to introduce you to God, so that you are exposed, so that you humble yourself before Him. And that's what Moses did. As a matter of fact, we see it all throughout the Old Testament. God reveals Himself to people. They are exposed. Remember Isaiah? What happened to him there um, uh, out at the temple? And God's glory was there. What did He do? He said, Woe is me. Don't say, Woe is me. And I'm a man of unclean lips. And so when we encounter Jesus for the first time, or, or even when we encounter, we realize, whoa, I'm not worthy. And that's why Moses says, who am I? Of which Travis sang a moment ago. And so we ask that question, when we encounter Jesus, who am I? I promise you, I'm not going to preach that sermon today. That is a sermon for another day. But God then begins to tell Moses that his people are oppressed, that the Israelites are oppressed, and it's time for them to be delivered, and that Moses is the guy. So Moses, you're my God. You're going to deliver my people. Moses is like, no, I don't think so, God. You've got the wrong guy, right? My life's good right now. I've got a wife, I've got a couple of sons, I've got a good job. Life's good. I don't even like Egyptians, okay? Um, I don't want to do that, God. And so uh, he says, I think you've got the wrong guy. A little secret here. I think you've got the wrong guy. A little secret here. Uh, God is never wrong. Never wrong about his people, and the calling is placed on them. All right, I'm just going to say that God is never wrong about his people and the calling that he has placed on him. There's been many times in my life that I looked at God and said, God, I think you've got the wrong guy here. All right, um, I wasn't even kidding when I was talking to kids. I would not be the one who want that microphone in my face. Right? We got a lot of kids who love to talk in the microphone, and I love it. Right? I love it because you know what? None of my kids are young enough to out me or anything, but I love hearing what these kids got to say. That wouldn't be me. I wouldn't have talked in the microphone. I would have shot away from the microphone. I wanted to hear what was being said, but I didn't want to say anything. And I was like that all the way through high school. Um, 
Matter of fact, you can ask Sonia. She's not here today. She's in nursery. But uh, you can ask her. I'm, I'm just a, I was a shy guy. She had to really bring me out of my shell. And then God says, all right, you think she did something that made me believe. I'm going to call you to preach. And now here I am. It still blows my mind. But God is never wrong about His people and the calling He's placed on His life. God does not make mistakes, church. Okay? God does not make mistakes. He did not make a mistake with Moses, and He did not make a mistake with you and your calling either. Now, I don't know what your calling is. I told the Sunday school class this morning, I said, I don't know what God has called you to, but He has called you. He has called every single one of us with a high calling, right? With a holy calling. I don't know what it is. God's not going to tell me because I don't have time to go around to 200 plus people and tell them what their calling is from God. I have a hard enough time wrestling with my own call. All right? But I have a feeling that you have an idea of what God's calling you to. It may be to, uh, uh, to pray. I don't know. Maybe to work with children. Maybe to work with nursery. I don't know what your calling is, but I guarantee that you have one. And if you don't know what it is, then you need to pray. You need to pray to seek out what it is. God's never wrong about His people and calling His place on His life. To say the least, Moses was not all going home about doing this task, about fulfilling this calling that God has placed upon his life. So he wasn't all about this mission of going to Pharaoh and telling him to release the Israelites, right? The plan didn't make sense to Moses. So God, I don't know how this is going to work. Listen to me, church. Sometimes, you need to hear this, sometimes God's plan does not make sense for us. To say. Sometimes God's plans just don't make sense to us. And so let's apply that to our personal lives, right? Sometimes God's plan does not make sense to us. Let's apply it to the church, right? Sometimes God's plans for the church doesn't make sense to us. You don't have to have God's plan figured out, okay? You don't have to have God's plan figured out to accept it and serve it. It's about trusting God. All right? And so, um, if you trust God, then you shouldn't have a problem with His plan. But if you don't trust God, then you have all kinds of problems with His plan. All right? And so, guess what? I can tell the difference. You can tell the difference. Do you trust His plan? Does it make sense to you? It doesn't matter. Do you trust Him? Most was like, okay, uh, who am I? God, who am I to walk into Pharaoh's palace and say, let my people go? Moses was like, or God was like, Moses, it's not about you, okay? Some of us need to be reminded of that, right? Moses, it's not about you. Who am I that I would go to Pharaoh's palace and ask you to let the children of Israel? Who am I? And you fill in the blank. And let me tell you, God's saying, it's not about you. It's not about you. He says, certainly I will be with you. <laughs> certainly I will be with you. So I think it's fascinating the last two names that we looked at. God, we looked at Adonai last week from Psalm 8. And then we look at Exodus 3 and Moses here. And David wrote the Psalm 8. And, and what did he say? He says, what is man that you would be thoughtful of him? And then Moses says, who am I? To go and do this task that you call me to. So when, when we get into the presence of God and we begin to wrestle with what He's called us to do, that's the stance a lot of times we take is, is, is God, who am I? What is man that you would even consider for Him to be a part of what you are doing? And so we see that both in Moses, we see that in David, I see that in my life, and I'm sure that you see that in your life. But we need to be reminded that God's not saying, all right, if you don't do it, then I'm stuck, right? He's saying, look, it's not about you. It's not about you and your abilities. It's not about you and your whatever uh, talent you may or may not have. He says, it's not about you, Moses. I'll be with you. Really, this is about me. And, and he's talking about himself. He's talking about God. But I love what God says. God, and I think God's got a sense of humor. Um, and I think that that's why it's okay to laugh in church, okay, and uh, just have a little fun. Um, but I think God's got a sense of humor because this is what he says there. He says, I will give you a sign after it's over, right, um, that you'll serve me on this mountain. So let's take a look at the sign that he, that he gives them. I think it's in verse, um, I think it's in verse uh, 12. So he gives him this task, and, and then he says, Verse 12, so he said, I will certainly be with you, great promise, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. He's like, I don't give you a sign, Moses, 
but I'm not going to give you the sign until after you do the job. Okay? That's, to me, I find that common because, all right, most of us want signs to even know for sure this is what we're supposed to do. God, give me a sign so that I know that this is what you want me to do. This is where you want me uh, to go, right? I'm just going to throw this out there, okay? I'm not sure how reassuring a sign would be after I do what God has called me to do. I'm not sure how reassuring that would be. So many of us need a sign before we do anything for God. Like, God, give me a, give me a sign that this is what you want me to do or this is where you want me to go. But God was like, yeah, I'll give you a sign after you complete the mission. I'll give you a sign later. I'm not sure that I get that, but what makes this sign so awesome? And what makes this sign so great is that it's more than a sign. It's a promise. That's what it is. You call it a sign, but, but it's really a promise here. So if you're looking for a sign in your life, I would say be careful. If you're looking for a sign in your life, I would say be careful. Signs can be deceiving, but God's promises are firm and true and absolute. Amen? So if you're looking for a sign, be careful because they can be deceiving. The enemy can cast up some signs just uh, as quick as anybody, right? The enemy can do signs as well. So we can be deceived by signs. But you can't be deceived by God's promises, right? God's promises are firm and true and absolute. So what God is telling you here, what God is telling most here is, look, look, uh, it's not just a sign, this is a promise that... This is going to happen, and you're going to worship me right here at this spot when they are released. So many of us are like, God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. And God's like, no, I gave you a promise. Amen? He's like, God, give me a sign. And God's like, no, I gave you a promise. And from our perspective, that promise is the Holy Spirit and His Word. Right? We can cling to it. We can hold to it. And we can grasp it. Now, speaking of promises, I promise we're going to get into the name. I promise. Moses understands that God will take care of Pharaoh now. We've got background at the introduction done. Uh, but he has another concern now. Or an excuse. Sometimes we use those words interchangeably. Uh, Moses raises another concern. I call it an excuse. Right? And that's but what if the children of Israel ask who sent me and what is his name? So look at verse 13. This is the other excuse, or this is the other concern that Moses had. Then Moses said, God, indeed, uh, uh, it says, indeed, you're obviously going to be witness. You're going to take care of Pharaoh. But when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to you? And so he has this other concern. He has this whole other excuse of why he can't go. Because he don't know God's name. Right? He don't know what to tell the children of Israel. Alright, I get it. I know what to tell Pharaoh, but I don't know what to tell God. I don't know what to tell the children of Israel. So now in verse 14 and 15, we see where God calls himself Yahweh. We see where God calls himself by name. So now he asked that question. Let's look at how God responds. Verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord, Yahweh, or Jehovah, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name. What name? Yahweh, Jehovah. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. So his name, Yahweh, or Jehovah, is a memorial not just to the nation of Israel, but to all nations. It's a memorial to us. This is why it's important that we know Yahweh, why we know Jehovah, why we're looking at it even this morning. Okay? So he, he tells him to say, I am who I am. I sent you. I sent you to you. Now in verse 14, we don't have the name Yahweh or Jehovah, but we do in verse 15. And I explained that to you. That's the Lord with the all caps. This is the first this is not the first mention of Yahweh. 
in the Old Testament. It's not the first mention of it. But in this text, we get the glimpse of what the name means. We get a glimpse of what the name Yahweh or Jehovah means. Now, before we get into that, I need to explain some things to you, all right? So put on your thinking caps, all right? Let's put these on. If you're going to need them, because we're about to do some English or some Hebrew, whatever you want to call it. So put your thinking caps on. Now, has anyone ever heard the word? I hope that I said it right, because I've been practicing all weekend. Has anyone ever heard the word tetragrammaton? It's going to be on the screen. Anybody ever heard that word before? You've been in any kind of seminary. I didn't, even, I didn't even hear it in seminary. Tetragrammaton. You've probably never heard that name or that word before. Uh, but has anyone ever heard the word or the game Tetra? Ever played the game Tetra? Yeah. A few of you have. Some of you maybe not so much ever had Game Boy or anything. But anyway, Tetra is a huge Game Boy game. And what is Tetra? Tetra, the game, um, is a game where you take the, the these shapes made out of four blocks, right? And you just kind of manipulate the box, the blocks as they fall down, you want to create the rows so they disappear and try to get a high score. That's the point of the game. But a tetragrammaton means four letters. So tetragrammaton means four letters. And so I figured you could relate tetra the game with tetragrammaton because of the four blocks and now we've got the four letters. And the most famous tetragrammaton of all time is the name of God in Hebrew, which is Y-H-W-H. Alright? That's the tetragrammaton for God's name in the Old Testament some 6,500 times in 5,500 verses. Now, I don't want to get too technical with this name and bore you to the details, but there are a few things that you need to know about this name. Now, this name of God was considered so sacred that they took very serious the law where it says do not take the name, Lord's name in vain, that they wouldn't even say this name of God. They wouldn't even say it. Not they write it, they left blanks. Because they didn't want to, because they were fallen people, they were sinners, and they didn't feel worthy to even write God's name. And so they wouldn't. As a matter of fact, they didn't feel worthy enough to even say God's name. And so they didn't. So um, in all reality, no one really knows how to say God's name. Nobody knows how to say God's name the way he said it here in Exodus chapter 3. Because the children of Israel and Jewish scholars, they wouldn't say it. And so it was never said. And Bible scholars can't figure out how to say it. And we guess, but we don't, we don't really know how to say it. We don't, know, we don't know how many syllables it is. We don't know if it's one syllable, two syllables, three syllables. We don't have a clue. We're guessing at this name of God because the children of Israel wouldn't even say this name. And so the Hebrew language, it doesn't have vowels and stuff. It has lots of yod and idols and tittles and things like that in it that kind of describe how to say the words. But it has no vowels. So we're not really sure how it's supposed to sound. We don't really know how to say this name. And so the reason we say Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E and I'll put that up on the screen. The reason we say Yahweh spelled like that, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E um, is because they took the first letter, and this is true, all right? This is true. This is where we get the name Yahweh. Um, they took the first letter of Adonai, which is A, and dropped that between the Y and the H, and then they took the first letter of Elohim, which is another name of God, which we're going to look at a little bit later, which is the God uh, in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. That word God is Elohim in the Hebrew. So they took the first letter of Elohim and put that between the W and H, and voila, you have Yahweh, right? And so that's where, that's where the name Yahweh comes from. And why is it done that way? I have no idea. Don't know. But how do you say it? I mean, we had to have some way of saying it because nobody ever said it. Nobody ever knew what it was. Again, no one ever knew how to say God's name. In translation, right, whenever they're translating the Bible um, into, um, into Greek, which was the Septuagint, or into Latin, which is the Vulgate, when they were doing the translations, uh, they had to come up with something. Right? And so this is, this is kind of what they come up to. And so in translation, all that we're trying to do is help it make sense to us, which is good. And I'm thankful that God helps us uh, with that, but He also gives us context. So we can really look at the context and understand what God's name means. But 
Uh, before we look deeper into his name, I want to answer the question, where in the world did Jehovah come from? Right? Why do I keep saying Yahweh and Jehovah? In my notes, everywhere I got, Yahweh or Jehovah, Yahweh or Jehovah, they're the same word. They don't sound the same, but they're the same word. Uh, so where did Jehovah come from? There's no difference in translation or anything between Jehovah and Yahweh. Uh, we see where Yahweh comes from. We saw that. So where does Jehovah come from? Jehovah is actually uh, a much later variant of Yahweh. As a matter of fact, Jehovah didn't even come into existence probably until the 16th century. So it's probably 500, maybe 500 years old. 16th century is when it came along. So uh, and I'm going to put this on the screen. The word Jehovah comes from a three-syllable version of YHWH. Remember I told you, we don't even know how many syllables God's name even is. All right? And so Jehovah comes from the three-syllable version of YHWH, Yehovah. Now, the Y was replaced with a J, although Hebrew does not even have a J. I don't understand our J sound. And with the W, uh, with a V. Plus, the extra value of the resulting in Jehovah. That's where we get the name Jehovah, right? But it's a little deeper than that. These vowels um, are the abbreviated forms. And now here's where we get technical in English. These vowels are the abbreviated forms of the imperfect tense, the participle form, and the perfect tense of the Hebrew verb being, or as we say in English, is. Because what did, what, did, what did Moses say? Or what did God say to Moses? He says, I am. Right? That's part of the word or the verb is. Not to give you an English lesson like that. So, so that I love. The meaning Jehovah could be understood as he will be, is, and has been. Okay? He will be, he who will be, is, and has been. That's all you need to know about Jehovah. All right? Now that I've absolutely lost everybody here, um, I want to bring everything back together. All right? I want to bring everything back together and hopefully give you some application. What in the world are we going to do with the tetragram time? Never want to use that in a sentence. You don't have to be able to say God's name correctly to understand what His name means. And I thank God for that. So, what does this name, Yahweh or Jehovah, mean to us? What does that mean to us? Obviously, this name speaks to God's sovereignty, right? As all of His names do. All of God's names speak to His sovereignty. That He is in complete and utter control. And we can rest easy knowing that. But more importantly, the name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, speaks to God's presence. It speaks to God's presence. So if we look back over the last several names of God, we talked about El Shaddai, that talks about the power of God, how He is Almighty. And then we looked at El Yom that talks about the place of God, that He's above all. Then we, then we looked last week at Adonai, that's the placing of God to the highest place. And now we're looking at Yahweh, and that speaks to God's presence. God's presence. God is here. Look back and see what He told Moses again in verse 14 and verse 15. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he says, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord, and here's the key, the Lord God of your fathers. Remember that Lord is Jehovah or Yahweh. The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and this is my memorial to all generations. To and through Moses, God is saying, I was with Abraham. I was with Isaac. I was with Jacob. I am with you, Moses. And I will be with the children of Israel. And I will be with you forever and ever as a promise to you, as a memorial to you. And so what does He say? You tell them that I am that I am with them and I am uh, rescuing them. I am delivering them. And so Yahweh speaks to God's presence. This is also reiterated in the New Testament. Right? When we get into the New Testament, it's uh, prophesied in the Old Testament, but then when we get into the New Testament, 
Um, Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Speaks to God's presence, right? And so here we have Yahweh in the Old Testament and then uh, a reference to Emmanuel from the Old Testament and the New Testament speaks about God's presence, that God is with us. So I want you to know this morning that no matter what it is you're going through, no matter what it is you're battling, God is with you. You need to be reminded today that God is with you. He is present. He's here. I'm not sure why we do this in church, but we have a habit of, of saying, I am guilty, probably worse than anybody else in this room. But I have a habit of saying, we invite God's presence into our worship and into our life. God, I just want you to be present in my life. God, I want you to join us for worship. Listen, God is already here. God is already here. And so let's glorify Him. Amen? He's here. Let's glorify Him. He's not waiting up in heaven at 1055 saying, Man, I sure hope they invite me to be with Him today. I hope that they're anticipating my presence and let me go. That's not the way God works. God's not doing that up in heaven. He's here, right? He is already here. God is at work all around us. He's already at work. And just like He was in Moses' day, He's inviting us to join Him. We kind of get it backwards. We kind of get it backwards. We're like, God, I want to invite you into this aspect of my life. God, I want to invite you in to this worship. And God's saying, really? How about this? How about I invite you into what I'm doing? How about I invite you into what I have going on? Because I'm the one working here. I'm the one doing everything here. And so He's inviting us. That's what the name Yahweh is. present. He's already here. And he, He's inviting us to be a part of Him. Not so much us inviting Him. But it's about Him inviting us. As a matter of fact, you would have probably never called on the name of Jesus if He would have invited you into a relationship with Him. Because He seeks... And saves that which is lost. He come looking for you. You may have been looking for answers. You may maybe looking for something to fill a void in your life. But he comes seeking you. He's the one who made the void um, evident. And then he came, and hopefully he filled it. He was present. He's always present. So God is at work all around us, and he's saying, "Join me. Join me in what I'm doing." Just like he told Moses. Moses is like, or God's like, you know what? I'm ready to rescue my people. I'm ready to deliver my people. I'm ready to send them to the land that I have promised them. This is the work I'm going to do. Moses, come with me. And so to the congregation today, God is saying, look, i got to work for prophets. i got to work for the community of Holly Ridge. And he's saying to me and he's saying to you, join me. Join me. Join me in what, we're going, what, what I'm doing here. And so it's not our work. Right? It's His work. It's not my work. It's His work. I'm just joining in with what God wants to do. He's inviting you to be a part of the work that He's doing. And most importantly, that if, you, if, you, if you've never been saved, if you never give Christ your life, He's, in, he's inviting you into eternal life by accepting His Son, Jesus Christ. So He's inviting you to be a part of His kingdom. He's inviting you to be a part of His eternal work. We've got to quit making things about ourselves. Start making everything about God. We've got to quit making everything about ourselves. Start making everything about God. So if you're living for yourself, it's time to quit. Start living for God. If you never accepted Christ, I want to invite you to come forward this morning. Accept Jesus in your heart and life. Repent of your sins. Be a part of the greatest kingdom. The only kingdom. The kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. As we pray, Travis, and musicians come. Father, we thank you and praise you again for this day. Lord, for your word, for the reassurance that you give us, God, we need to be reminded, God, our, 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 our vision speaking for myself primarily needs to be shifted at times. God, it's not about inviting you into what I want to do. God, it's about you inviting me into what you want to do. And so, God, I pray. 
Lord, that you'll direct my heart in that direction. Lord, that you'll direct all our hearts in that direction. God, without a doubt, everyone here sitting here today has a holy call upon their life. God, may, we, may we be sensitive to that. Answer that, Lord, and, and dive in to what you're doing. But God, most of all, I pray that if there's one here today who's lost without you, never given their life to you, God, may you speak to their heart. God, may you invite them into the kingdom. Or may they come and share and testify for what you're doing.